The Lord and the devil, you got to forgive me for this, Paul. The Lord and the devil had a had an argument, and uh, the Lord told the devil, he said, well, I'll just sue you. And he said, you can't do that. He said, what do you mean you can't do that? He said, it took you a hundred years to get a preacher. Where are you going to get a lawyer? We got a film of, about a baptism. Let's put it up there before we get started here. Put this, put this film up. This is a wonderful film. It's just a couple of weeks ago. Okay, I want to ask you a question here. Take your confession in front of God, in front of uh, our fellow believers. Christiana, do you believe with all of your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He came to die for your sins? Yes. Okay, can you confess His name by saying, Lord Jesus? Lord oh, Jesus. Okay. Based on your confession, Christian, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the remission of your sins in order that you might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let the church say amen. amen. She's, uh, she's uh, been sober now for almost a month in the 24-hour club. We're really proud of her. Amen. And uh, we want her to continue to go on with that life of sobriety. We've got a lot of sick people. Uh, uh, Art Bigger has, has got them shingles. It's just killing him, and, and y'all pray for him. There's a lot of people sick. I, bro, uh, I owe Brother Armin an apology. He was in here last week, and I had him all wrong. He was just sick. That's the only reason he didn't stand up. But, you know, this, uh, I'm sorry for insulting him personally, but the rules still work. If you're going to be here, worship with us. When we sing, you sing, or hum along with us, and we pray, uh, and don't be talking and make mumbling because we're making a radio uh, program here. It's going out to all the world, and Africa deserves a decent radio program, and all of these other countries deserve a decent radio program. So don't be whispering and, and disrespecting us. Go outside and do your talking and, and come back in quietly. Um, we're going to have prayer, and then Eddie's going to come give us a jail report. Then I've got to already have the, the uh, proxy vote of the trustees, and y'all will get to see a trustees meeting here this morning. I'll explain to you what's going on there. So uh, first we'll go to the Father in prayer, and then we'll have a jail um, uh, report. Almighty God, King of the universe, have mercy upon us. We're sinners. The devil hates this and, and uh, would do anything to stop it. And I'm sorry that I've got old clothes, and, and, uh, and, but I know that I can uh, meet your favor in preaching in, a, in an apron just as well as I can in a suit. So uh, we pray that you uh, help and bless us. We're already tired and we're already dependent on your strength and your strength alone. We depend on you and you alone to... Uh, fund this place we don't have any money and so we depend on you and you alone to fund this place and send the money that it takes to do this work we pray that we uh meet your favor by feeding these two thousand meals a week to the poor and homeless and preaching the gospel to all the world i myself uh, confess to you that i have an anger problem i always have all my life and and i pray that you continue to Help me get that under control. I'm very weak regarding that, Father, and you promised not to give me any temptation that I can't bear. So don't let none of these yahoos put their hands on old people around me or, or none of this silly craziness that's been going on around here. Uh, we turn to all of them that, are, that robbed us and everything. We pray for them that they, uh, that they might find salvation and repent of their sins. We uh, don't want to see them burn forever and go to hell, but they're in your hands, and we uh, turn them over to your discipline. And I pray that you'll fight where I won't have to, because you know I don't want to get a life sentence, and, and uh, so I just turn it all over to you. Please, please bless our jail ministry, our hospital chaplains. Please bless uh, our worldwide radio audience and our website. Please protect it, Father, from hackers. And please uh, please uh, uh, be with our feeding ministry and all the things that we do here to feed the poor and the homeless. And please help us that we might grow. And bless all of these churches that have come to help us today. 
We uh, pray that you bless every hand that gives and every hand that takes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. We, have a, we have a cry room if you have children or anything. and uh, You go right back here to the back and there's a real nice room back there and you can still hear us. And so uh, tell us about that jail ministry. Uh, Good morning, church. This being the last Sunday of the year that I'm going to be here, I'd like to give a report of all the churches that are involved. I know all y'all see is me in this prison ministry. A lot of times we see the 20,000 that we've baptized since 1998. 20,000. It's, it's, it's not just me. <laughs> so I want to take a minute to recognize the churches. I would like to recognize all the men, but I know it's about 30, 35 men and women. Let's cut this. So I don't know it all. <laughs> I'm not going to name them all. But I want first, the largest uh, body of people that, that work with us is from Greenville Avenue. And I see they're here today, Amen. and the one man that goes to the jail with me is sitting in the audience. Uh, Brother Angelo, would you please stand up and get recognized? That's Brother Angelo Rodriguez and his son from Greenville Amen. Avenue. We also have a group from Walnut Hill. No, y'all hold a, hold a clap in here, uh, brother. Yeah. Uh, Crocker Hill Church of Christ, Mountain View, Cedar Valley, uh, Cherry Valley. Uh, what's that? Uh, Oh, that's Main Street. I could read more right now. Yeah, what's Main going on? Street. Here we got uh, Manuel Brantley and Ernie Sims. I don't know if he's here. And of course, myself and all the prayers of the church that we get every Saturday, I mean, every Sunday, every week. And then, of course, Satin Road Church of Christ. All these uh, churches uh, contribute some way or another, mostly in physical appearance, going to different prisons all over. So that's how we reached. 20,000 plus this year. We ask y'all to continue to pray for us and we'll continue to do what God asks us to do. God bless you, brother. Brother Eric, he's, uh, he's, he's taught and baptized 20,000 people uh, since 1998. He got his preacher training right here at Main Street and he went out from here and uh, he's done all this on his own. He's non-paid just like all of us. I've been here 25 years and I haven't got a paycheck yet. And so... Uh, uh, they uh, threatened to cut my pay in half, and I told them I just dare you to do it. And so we'll see about that. We'd like to welcome our worldwide radio audience to the worship of the Main Street Church of Christ. We're a poor inner city congregation dedicated to preaching the gospel to the whole world and feeding the poor. Um, we have uh, several announcements this morning, and, and uh, uh, Trump stole my book, The Art of the Deal. <laughs> And, and, and got rich on it. And, uh, and I've got an attitude about that. He shouldn't have done that. Um, but I've practiced that all my life. And see, the art of the deal is that you make an offer so ridiculous, some people will take you up on it, and you've really won. You've knocked it out of the ballpark. But other people will begin to negotiate with you and you'll meet somewhere in the middle and, and you've, you've still got a good deal. And so God really blessed us. Uh, WWCR, our worldwide radio station, contacted us and said, we've got an hour that we'll let you have. We like you preaching because you don't be begging for money and hustling people and stuff. Don't sell anything. Um, and so we'll give you an hour to all the world every day for $800 a month. And so... I only announced it here to the church and to the people on the web is the only people that heard it. And Monday, I had a phone call that said, uh, the person said, I'll pay for it for the rest of my life. And so that was a wonderful deal. And so now we're on the radio every day to all the world. And one of our broadcasters at another station already gives us a cut rate and he said, I see you went on uh, 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 WWCR every day. He said, we want you on our, our station every day. He said, we got 3 to 4 in the afternoon, 11 to 12 at night. And uh, he said, we'll give you that for $95 a week apiece. And uh, I said, well, I'll ask the trustees that Sunday. And so I didn't speak to anybody. But Monday, I told him, I said, no, nah, we hadn't got the money and, and uh I said, uh, it's it's real problem. We don't have the money. But I said, I'll tell you what I do. I get $850 a month in Social Security, and they take $100 out for Medicare. And, and so uh, I, I net 750 a month. And if you make that deal, buy one, get one free, I'll pay for it myself out of my Social Security check and uh, $95 a week. Now, that would be two hours every day to 122 countries. 
And he said, no, no, we can't do that. The electricity's too much. And I said, I know it is. And uh, so he's, I said, I'll keep trying to raise money. Call me back next week. And so he talks to the owner. owner said, no, no, we can't do that. That's crazy. And so he calls back the next week. And I said, no, it's, that's all there is, man. It's $95. Buy one, get one free is all we can do. And next week, i tell you the truth, I was going to call him back, offer him 75 for one hour and tell him he could keep that other one. I didn't want it. And I got home Friday, and there was an answering machine, had a message on it. It says, we'll take it. We'll take the $95 a week for two, uh, two hours of international radio broadcast to 122 countries. That means that we're paying $9.50 an hour, less than minimum wage, to broadcast to 122 countries. Only God could do that. So I've asked... I've asked the trustees for permission, and I've got a quorum that's all agreed, and so we have approved that this morning. And you know, the real question is, is how long God is going to allow me to pay for that out of my own pocket when all there's, all there's rich people out there that could do something about it? I had a guy ask me this week, he said, this church, he said, he said, don't they know about this work down here? And I said, yeah, they've been over here. They looked at it. They love us. He said, they love you. I said, yeah, they just don't love us one dollar, but they love us, you know. <laughs> so that's the way it works. We've studied Genesis, and now we're in Exodus. And the, the, uh, as we've gone through Exodus, the date of the Exodus is a very, very important thing that you uh, find the date of the Exodus as 1447 B.C., the early date of the Exodus. And um, we studied that, and I'd encourage you in any of these things that you don't understand, we'd encourage you to go back and get my lessons that's on the website and is on YouTube, and you can watch them or listen to them. Uh, the word Ramesses is a scribal editorial update. The, is, the Israelis left from... Arvis, which was later in the 12th century named uh, Ramesses. Uh, we studied about the baby, uh, the miracle of the baby Moses, and how he was adopted probably by Hatshepsut, uh, Pharaoh's daughter, and how Moses then kills an Egyptian, and he uh, hides his body in the sand and has to go away as a fugitive. And so uh, he uh, meets God at the burning bush, and we studied that. And then we studied also how that Jesus seven times in the New Testament claims to be the God who met Moses at the burning bush. Um, at the time Moses fled, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He could have inherited the throne outright. And so Moses comes back now and confronts Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And then we studied the plagues. It was uh, uh, all the plagues against uh, Egypt. And it was all of them were against the false gods of Egypt. The gods of the Egyptians that, uh, uh, that they worship. They worship the Nile. And, and God caused the Nile River to run its blood. And they worshiped he quit the frog-headed goddess of fertility, which was a naked woman with big breasts and genitalia and, and a frog's head. And God showed that he quit, couldn't even control the fertility of frogs, much less people. And so they worshiped Ra, the sun god, and God blocks out the sun for three days and three nights. And so there was great judgment upon all the gods of Egypt, and God said, I will get my judgment against the gods of Egypt. And then we studied the final plague, the plague of the Passover. And... Um, uh, the death of the firstborn, which is really just a shadow of the Lord's Supper. Then we saw the Exodus, that there was 600,000, and that word men is fighting men, and that word for thousand is really chiefs. It could be translated in 10 different ways. If you go on to my written lesson, you'll see that it could be chiefs or captains or company commanders or whatever. So Moses really had about 6,000 fighting men when he left. And so we studied then the parting of the Red Sea and the drowning of Pharaoh's 600 chariots. 
Then we studied uh, part of the Ten Commandments and the Greatest Command. And then we studied the uh, uh, last couple of weeks, the Shema. And Shema is in Hebrew, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And all Orthodox Jews uh, say the Shema at least three times a day, and the really Orthodox say it seven times a day. And so I'm going to give you the Shema now. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Ehad Baruch Shem Ki Avad Malahu To Leolam Vaed Hallelujah Now the Shema that would be wrong for me to do that if I didn't translate it for you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Blessed be the name of thy kingdom for all eternity. Now that last clause, blessed be the name of thy kingdom for all eternity, is not found in Deuteronomy 5 that they're quoting from. They've added that to it because Jesus said, he took, he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy mind, and thy neighbors, thyself. And so they didn't want to say the rest of that verse because it'd be like what Jesus said. So they added that, Blessed be the name of thy kingdom for all eternity. And so look what God's doing. He's got every Orthodox Jew blessing the churches of Christ for all eternity. Isn't that wonderful? Seven times a day they pray for us and they don't even know it. They'd have a stroke if they knew it, if they had any idea. Because see, the kingdom of God is a church. And so God has got them blessing us seven times a day. I'd like to encourage our radio audience to go to our website at www.churchofchristpreaching.com. The Ten Commandments in the New Covenant we're going to study this morning. Some of the commandments have been known for ages. Thus the heart of the Decalogue, which means the Ten Commandments, was already known law. There are 16, uh, 613 total laws in the uh, first five books of the Bible. The uh, non-believing scholars for years had said, oh, it's impossible for Israel to have, uh, uh, for that to have been written in 1447 B.C. because such advanced law codes were not known back in that day. And then they found the law code of Hammurabi. And Hammurabi lived, some people say in 2000 B.C., others in 1700. And his law code has many things that's included in the Ten Commandments. See, it was wrong to murder all over the world. It was wrong to steal all over the world. And so um, some of those things are, are uh, similar. But the differences are obvious and numerous. The Ten Commandments were given to Israel, and Israel is a nation, covenant nation alone, and not given to the Gentiles, according to Deuteronomy 5, 2, and 3. The first and greatest commandment of God was explained by Christ in Mark 12, 29 through 31. And Jesus answered him, The first of all these commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and all thy mind and with all thy strength. That's from Deuteronomy 5, 6, 4, excuse me, and 5. And this is the first commandment. And the second is like it, namely this, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's from Leviticus 19, 18. There's none other commandments greater than these. And so to look at that Leviticus 19, 18, we have to bring up verse 17 too. Let's pull that up if you can. Leviticus 19, beginning in verse 17. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor. In other words, if somebody offends you, you go to them and you tell them, hey, you offended me. You try to stop violence before it starts. And thou shalt not suffer sin upon him. See, he might be so stupid that he doesn't know that he's sinning. And thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, I am the Lord. And so in the Ten Commandments, 
in Exodus chapter 20, verse 1, and God spake all these words, saying, Verse 2, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. The Lord thy God, Yahweh, Elohecha, every individual person he is a God to. Verse 3, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Elohim, Asherim, no strange gods. The second commandment against making or worshiping of images. Uh, Verse 4, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or is in the earth beneath, there is in the water under the earth. Forty years later, when uh, the Israelis were about to enter the land, Moses gives his final sermon in Deuteronomy chapter 4. And he said, Now God had given the Ten Commandments. He came down in smoke and thunder and and a great sound of a trumpet when he gave the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. And so Moses tells them 40 years later, now some of them people are still eyewitnesses. They were there. Everybody, Everybody over 40 years old is an eyewitness. They were there. He said, Take heed, therefore, good heed unto yourselves. For you saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb at Mount Sinai out of the midst of the fire. You didn't see any golden calf. You didn't see any Baal. You didn't see any Balaams. You didn't see any kind of idols or anything at all. Verse 5. Thou shalt not bow thyself down to them. So the first thing God says, don't make any graven images. Second thing is that you don't bow down to them nor serve them. For I am the Lord thy God, I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children until the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. What a disproportion between judgment and mercy. Justice works to the third and fourth generation, but mercy works unto a thousand generations. We'd like to encourage our radio audience to go to our website at www.churchofchristpreaching.com. Isn't that wonderful? Mercy works unto a thousand generations. Shakespeare said the quality of mercy is not strain. It droppeth from heaven as a gentle rain. On the place beneath here on earth, tis twice blessed. It blesses him that gives and him who takes. I'm telling you, I'm blessed every day when I give a sandwich, and the person that gets it, they're blessed too. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. It behooves the throne monarch better than his crown. If you want to live long, you want a good life, be merciful. Be merciful to everybody that will let you be merciful to. Third commandment against false swearing and blasphemy and irreverent use, irreverent use of God's name. Exodus 20, verse 7. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Everybody that says that GD thing around me, man, I tell them I try to get away from them because the Lord's liable to go strike them and not get a direct hit, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm really paranoid about that. And if you use a, that GD deal... I'm telling you right now, you're going to get hemorrhoids, you're going to get ingrown toenails, your, uh, your, your teeth will rot in your head. God will get you if you cuss him. I'm advising you to stop that first. Stop all that nasty talking second, and then stop cussing altogether. But stop that GD stuff first, because God says, I'm going to get that punk that cusses me. And God... Uh, I'm telling you, you ain't got a lawyer. Ain't no hope of you having a lawyer up there on that day unless it's Jesus. Fourth commandment against breaking the Sabbath and idleness on other days of the week. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and that's given to Jews only. And we as Christians in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to do what? Play a guitar? To break bread, to take the Lord's Supper, to proclaim his death until he comes. 
That's what we come together for. And so that's why we insist that you show great reverence while we take the Lord's Supper. That's a very special time to us in the churches of Christ. Hebrews 4, 9, There remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. You and I are going to rest, and that's when we get to heaven. We're going to have eternal rest, everlasting rest on those streets of gold and paradise. It's going to be wonderful. Ginger's waiting for me right up there at the gate. Exodus 20, verse 9. You know, she died the anniversary of her death. I went out to her grave every, uh, every day for the first year. And then I told her, you ain't there anyway, and so I'm going to come back next year. I'm not coming here every day anymore. So the next, when it was October 28th, which was on a Sunday, and I couldn't go till Sunday night here. So I left Sunday night, and I beat it out there to wrestling. You know, wrestling's like this, you know, back in there in that in the graveyard. And she's in a crib way back to the back, and I got in there, and it went, the sun went down, got dark, man. And I'm there, I'm, I'm there talking to her at her grave, and all them haints and spooks is out and all that stuff. And I try to get out of there, and I'm lost in this graveyard, man. And, and if I hadn't had a, a hydro coat on for my back and a, and a full tank of gas, I'd have had a panic attack, man. You know, I, I told her I'll be with you before long. It ain't going to be long. I mean, I'm 75 now. You know, I ain't got long. Exodus 20, verse 9, Six days shall I labor and do all thy work. The fifth commandment is uh, about disrespect to parents. I'd like to encourage our radio audience to go to our website at www.churchofchristpreaching.com. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And of course, I'll give you all the example of Alvin Jennings, a great Christian that his children have dishonored him because he's got that old-time religion, and he won't rock and roll with them, and he won't play in a band with them, and he won't do all the things, go singing and clapping and dancing down the aisle. He worships like we worship here, and they've disfellowshipped him now for eight, nine years, and nobody will have anything to do with him and his family. And see, the Bible says that. Jesus said, I came not to bring peace but the sword, and that your own family will turn against you in Luke 12. And it sure happened to Alvin. Shame on his family. In the New Testament it says, Ephesians 6, 2, Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment of promise. I wrote one of the brothers an email, and I told him, I said, you know something? If you can get away with disrespecting your daddy, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, that every son that he receiveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son that he receives. I'm, I didn't quote that exactly right. Look it up, but it's close. And um, I told him, I said, it just shows that if you can disrespect your daddy and live to a ripe old age, it'll show that you never become a Christian in the first place, that you just raised with a silver spoon in your mouth, and when daddy paid for all your colleges, sent you to the best colleges and universities, and now you're disrespecting your daddy. Shame, shame, shame on. Moses repeated this commandment as the people were about to enter the land in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16. Honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God has commanded thee that thy days may be prolonged. God says if you disrespect your mom and your daddy and you don't repent of it and become a Christian, that he's going to kill you pretty quick. And that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And Alvin's other son died at 50 years old of cancer just last year. The sixth commandment against murder and cruelty. In uh, Exodus 20 verse 13, thou shalt not kill. Now that's talking about murder. It's not talking about uh, manslaying and things of that nature. As an example in, or the capital punishment in a uh, uh, Genesis 9, 6, it says, Whoso showeth man, sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in an image of God made he man. 1 John 3, 15 says, Whoso hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life. And so 
uh, we encourage you to uh, not hate anybody in your heart at all. But of course, it's uh, all right to take life to save life. If Al-Qaeda comes in here today, I guarantee you they won't leave. They will not leave, They'll except to go meet the Lord and talk to him. The seventh commandment is against adultery and uncleanliness. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus amplified on that in Matthew 15, 19, when he says, For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adultery, and fornication, thefts, and false witnesses, and blasphemy. Matthew 5, 27, he even modified it even further. And he says, you have heard that it was said in old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that everyone that looketh upon a woman with lust in his heart hath committed adultery with her already. The eighth commandment is against stealing and dishonesty. Thou shalt not steal. Oh, forgive me, Lord. I used to think the FBI said that, but you know, it was really God. You know, really was. And uh, that's no excuse for Robin Hoods either, you know. Uh, no excuse for any kind of stealing at all. The ninth commandment is against false testimony and perjury. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. The tenth commandment is against covetousness. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife nor his manservant nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is in our neighbors. The term law, Paul even used and amplified it to refer to the entire Old Testament. Often this is uh, referred to as a corpus of the 613 laws given in the first five books of the Bible. Again, we'd like to encourage our radio audience to go to our website at www.churchofchristpreaching.com. Why don't you become one of the 10,000 home churches we have established in the world? Tune in, same time, same station next week. Invite your family over, invite neighbors over. Sing, tune us in for preaching, read the Bible, pray, take the Lord's Supper, gather up a contribution yourself and don't send it to me. Keep it there and buy Bibles and do good for the poor in your own community. Build a church just like the original church started in houses. Build a church in your house, your igloo, your hut, your tent, wherever you're at, anywhere in the world. You don't need a fancy band or anything else. Just sing, preach, pray, take the Lord's Supper and give. That's just the five things God tells us to do. Now, God gave this old covenant to the Israel as a nation, as a covenant nation, but he had something else in mind from before the foundation of the world. Titus 1-2 says that God promised eternal life before the world began. In Jeremiah 31-31, God begins to tell us a little about that. He says, Behold, a day comes, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant now. Not like his old covenant, the Ten Commandments, with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Not about like the Ten Commandments that I just read you, which my covenant they break, although I was a husbandman to them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, that I will put my laws in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall no more teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No, the Lord. Listen to me, brethren, listen to me. One of the worst things that's going on in the church of Christ is fourth, second, third, fourth generation Church of Christ people who think that they're born and raised up in the Church of Christ. I'm telling you right now, you cannot be born and raised up in the Church of Christ. You must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. No person without having a come to Jesus minute and come into God in the appropriate way is born in the Church of Christ. And just because your daddy and your mama was members of the church all their life, that doesn't do anything for you. 
Y'all going down just a little early there, brethren, next time. We'll wait a little while. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother. You see, the Jews, the Jews, if you were born a Jew, you had to be taught to know the Lord. Little baby Jew doesn't know the Lord. You had to be taught to know the Lord. And so, uh, y'all wait just a minute before you go down. They don't need all that help down there yet. Um, if you were born a Jew, you, uh, you had to be taught to know the Lord. But see, to, when you're a Christian, you know the Lord already. You've already come to the Lord. Everybody in the kingdom of God knows the Lord. For they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, oh, thank God, and remember their sins no more. God can't even remember all the sorry, right and no good things that I've said, done, or thought. He can't even remember them because it's washed away in the blood of Jesus. This is a wonderful deal. This new covenant, I'm encouraging you, be part of this new covenant. It's your only hope. Obey the new covenant before it's everlasting too late because if you don't, there's nothing left but anguish and gritting and gnashing of teeth and eternal punishment and damnation. Hebrews 8, 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. How much also is he the mediator of a better covenant. See, this is better than the Ten Commandments Christianity is, which was established upon better promises. It's a better promise that their sins and iniquities I remember no more than it is thou shall not steal. Thou shall not steal can't forgive you. See, there's no forgiveness. If you sin, you die. There's no forgiveness under the law. But this new way, this new covenant, there's forgiveness. In Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. That's written in Deuteronomy 21-23, speaking to man that's hung or crucified, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day, for he that is hanged is cursed of God. And thy land shall not be defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Since Christ was crucified on a tree, the curse of the law rested upon the Savior and the Redeemer of all mankind. This is in spite of the fact that Jesus Christ our Lord was the unique and only person of all time to keep the law perfectly. It's correct in seeing in this verse a rough parallel with 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Only by his crucifixion and suffering without the camp could the holy prophecies have been fulfilled by the Lord. I'd like to encourage our radio audience to go to our website at www.churchofchristpreaching.com. There's a thousand sermons on there, all kinds of written lessons. We'd encourage you to go on there. Isaiah 53, verse 1. This is a great substitutionary passage which is behind all of these decorations. In Isaiah 53, 1, he says, For who hath believed our report? Who among the Jews is going to believe Isaiah's prophecy about the coming of Christ? Well, not very many of them, only a small remnant. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The arm of God is always the saving power of God. Everybody that ever saw Jesus, those that saw him just riding a donkey into Jerusalem, they saw the arm of the Lord, the saving power of God, riding into Jerusalem upon the colt, the foal of an ass. Those that saw him in the manger, 
But thou Bethlehem of Euphrates, though thou be little among the clans of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me who shall be ruler in Israel, who's going forth have been from old, from everlasting. God says, I've been promising this Christ from back here, from old, from everlasting. And you know what it says in the verse in front of it? It says, and they shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon a cheek. Christ was born to die on a cross. Take that hat off, Elsie. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Christ is just going to be an ordinary man. He's not going to be anything special. He's not going to be like Hercules and Zeus and all the foreign gods. He's not going to be like that. He's going to be just a common, ordinary man like the Hebrew writer says. For since the children were partakers of flesh and blood, us, he himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him who hath the power of death, that is the devil. Yes, God had a plan before the foundation of the world to redeem all mankind in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Don't miss this opportunity. Don't fool this away, man. You're in the house of God. Repent today. Don't you dare leave here to eternal punishment and to eternal hellfire. Don't leave here without coming to Christ. He is despised. Notice it's a continuous action verb. He not only was despised back then, he's despised now. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid as if it were our faces from him. Isaiah is prophesying this 750 years before Christ is born. All the apostles run and hid their faces from him, didn't they? They all got scared and run and hid. And we hid for up what are our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Notice what God was doing. God was providing the covenant sacrifice, the covenant sacrifice of an innocent victim. God was in that Roman soldier punishing Christ, beating Christ, nailing Christ to the cross. God was punishing your sins and mine because we've been so sorry and so rotten. God was in those Roman soldiers taking every bit of his wrath and every bit of his fury out on Jesus. Stripped, smitten of God and afflicted. Verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of his peace was uh, was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Oh man, our souls can be healed with him. With his stripes your soul can be healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Every human being on earth is a sinner. All we, every one of us, all we like sheep have gone astray. And we have turned everyone to his own way. That's a parallelism. They have to balance all and everyone balances. Everybody is sinners. All we like sheep have gone astray. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity, the sin, the punishment of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Pilate said, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not I have power to crucify thee and power to release thee? He opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and a sheep is dumb before his shears, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison. And from judgment, that's the very seat that Pilate sat in and when he was sitting in the judgment seat. And who has declared his generation? 
for he was cut off out of the land of the living. Now look about this prophecy. We've got copies of this prophecy written 200 years before Christ was born in the Dead Sea Scrolls. This was really written 700 years before he's born, but all those, those scrolls have rotted and gone away. But we've got scrolls 200 years before Christ was born, so we know that this wasn't written afterward. This is written before it happened. He's killed in verse 8. Look at it. He's killed in verse 8. He's cut off out of the land of the living. What for? For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked. He's crucified between two thieves, one on the right hand and one on the left. And with a rich man in his death, and Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, went to Pilate to beg the body of Jesus. Because he had done no violence, neither is any deceit in his mouth. Now he's killed in verse 8, he's buried in verse 9. Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him and put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he, God, shall see his seed, his child, and do what? Pro long his days. How do you prolong somebody's days when you kill them in verse 8, you bury them in verse 9, how do you prolong their days? Well, you've got to raise them from the dead. There's no other way. And of course, that's the gospel, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So here is the gospel presented to you 750 years before Christ was born. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Jesus said, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe whatsoever things I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the world. He, God, shall see the travail of his soul, him suffering on the cross, and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, God wants you to get some knowledge. He wants you to know about this. He wants you to understand this, get some knowledge of this. And by his knowledge shall my righteous servant, see he's God's servant. He's a king, he's a prophet, he's a priest, and he's a servant. He's God's servant, and now he's God's righteous servant, the only righteous servant that God ever had. My righteous servant justify many, and that word justify means count as righteous, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Everybody that's going to be saved is going to be part of this spoil that he, Jesus, spoils the devil's house, the strong man's house, and takes many souls to glory, Jesus is going to be spoil the devil and save us and take us to glory if you'll follow him, if you'll be part of this Christianity. He shall spoil with the strong because he has poured out his soul unto death. He died on that cross. He was numbered with the transgressors, with the sinners, between two thieves and numbered with us too. And he bare the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He's making intercession for me right now. Every time I fell up, he says, no, 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 Lord. He said, he's one of mine. I'll discipline him. He'll straighten out. I'll, I'll take care of it. Boy, I'm telling you, you want Jesus as your high priest. You don't want, you don't want to live life without him. Christ bore the sins of all people. His stripes were the healing of all people. His chastisement was the peace of all people. His suffering was the salvation of all people. And God has laid upon him the iniquity of the soul. The righteousness of God. Notice that term, the righteousness of God. All the righteousness that God ever achieved upon the earth was wrought in Jesus Christ. Those who uh, would participate in the righteousness of God must do so in him. 
You've got to be in Christ to be a part of this righteousness of God. <clears throat> this has been admitted by all who ever studied the question. The righteousness of God only can save people, and that righteousness is found only in Christ Jesus. No man can be saved outside of Christ. It's in this context that we should uh, notice that the righteousness of God was achieved by Christ himself. And in answer to the question of what constitutes that righteousness, it's a furphy faith and obedience of Christ that uh, achieved that righteousness. The faith that saved in any absolute sense is the faith of Christ. This fact is dogmatically affirmed seven times in the New Testament. The King James translates it properly. Modern translations do not. It says, the faith of Christ. Speaking not only of the faith, the perfect faith in his life, in his death, burial, and resurrection, but also all of New Testament Christianity is the faith. So it's not just subjective faith, you having faith that will save you. That's the first step. You've got to have faith, and that will put you on the road to salvation. But faith must become faithfulness. You cannot continue robbing banks and be faithful and claim that you have faith. You can't do it. The Greek New Testament affirms this seven times that this faith is found in Christ Jesus. And it's not faith only, but it's perfect faith and obedience of the Son of God which worked all the true righteousness, which is the foundation of all human salvation. I'd like to encourage our radio audience to go to our website at www.churchofchristpreaching.com. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us and conjured us and taking it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. This is a reference to the Ten Commandments in the Decalogue. The distinction between the moral and ceremonial law has no meaning whatsoever to Paul. The law that slew him represented by the 10th commandment and the ministry of death was engraved on tables of stone by God's own hand. The handwriting of ordinances, this in this verse, signifies the tables of stone inscribed by the very finger of God. Now, can you imagine how precious those tables of stone were and Moses came down from the mount and found the people naked and dancing and having an orgy before the golden calf and Moses threw down the commandments and broke them. I don't know if that's a great sin or not, but they were written with the very finger of God. And of course, who broke the covenant was the people. It wasn't Moses, it was the people. They had said, all the Lord has said we will do, and they didn't do it. They didn't do it. How about you? And took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. These terms indicate the absolute cancellation and abrogation of the law of Moses. It's a fact that shouldn't be lost in uh, the heresy at Colossus was that they were involved in the law of Moses. Practically all of this chapter in Colossians is applied to that. The special application of this verse inclusive in the moral law of Moses also. These moral precepts of the law of Moses were the handwriting and ordinances of Almighty God Himself. Saturday, Sabbatarians make two mistakes and profound mistakes in their understanding of the Sabbath day. Commandment, in any sense, is a part of the moral law. Uh, it's the insistence of this uh, moral portion of the law of Moses is still in effect is uh, nothing but just craziness, just not so. In Romans chapter 3, verse 19, 
I'd like to encourage our radio audience to go to our website at www.churchofchristpreaching.com. The Jew readily granted that all of us Gentiles were lost, but they thought that they were, were really something special. And Paul says the reason that the law of Moses was given, we're going to begin reading in Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Now Paul is going to quote from the prophets, the Psalms, and the law of Moses to show you that all of the Old Testament has passed away and that we're only under the New Testament. Romans 3.10, as it is written in Psalms 14, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way, and they are together become unprofitable, and there's none that doeth good, no, not one. This is a bill of particulars. When you're indicted in federal court and about to go to trial, they give you a bill of particulars. And this bill of particulars tells you everything that they're charging you with and what they're going to do to you. And this is God's bill of particulars against every one of us. There's none righteous, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. There with their tongues they have used deceit, and the poison of the asp is under their lips. The poison of snakes, that comes from Psalms 5.9. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, Psalms 10.7. Their feet are swift to shed blood, Isaiah 59, 7 and 8. Destruction and misery are in their way, and the way of peace they have not known. And there is no fear of God before their eyes, Psalms 36, 1. Now we know that whatsoever things, now Paul just quoted from the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. Now, we know that whatsoever things is the law, so he puts all that together in the law, in the term, the law here, to show you that it's all passed away. Now, we know that whatsoever things the law says, it says to them that are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Most of the law of Moses is re-legislated in the New Testament. It's still... You'll lose your soul if you fornicate, commit adultery, do things like that. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and following, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor the abusers themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards shall inherit the kingdom of God. And then Paul says, And such were some of you. Such were all of us. But you were washed. See, you can come and become a Christian. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you, really, if you believe that gospel, there's no reason whatsoever for you to be lost this morning. You can march right down to front down here and make confession that you believe that Jesus is a Christ the Son of the living God. You can repent of your sins, be sorry for your sins. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. You can confess Christ as Lord and be baptized into Christ and have all your sins washed away and rise to newness of life and be a part of this new covenant and not under the condemnation of the law. If you're a sinner and you're a Christian, you've fouled up, you soiled your apron. My apron's filthy, ain't it? You soiled your apron. Then just meet me right down to front down here and let's confess our sins before God and repent of them and become brand new. If you're here today and you need to help the church, the prayers of the church, won't you come now before it's everlasting too late while we're standing?